I have mm -hmm. a Baptist friend who strongly believes that Holy Communion is just symbolic of Christ's love. How can I better yeah. show her the true presence found in the Eucharist? Question. How would you approach explaining this uh -huh. truth? And this is from Natalie from Memphis. So obviously, you know, Good. it's not unusual, certainly in pr the Protestant world, to see the Eucharist and the Lord's Supper yeah. as being totally symbolic. Uh, and that's actually been a struggle sometimes, yeah. I think, even in some of the, uh, uh, in our own church at times, in, in making sure people don't start to think that we're only talking about something right. that is uh, a sign in the sense of being symbolic as opposed to something being right. what it represents, right? Exactly. Um, you know, uh, uh, was it Angela, um, um, uh, the person answering your question? In any, in any case, <clears throat> the main thing to remember is that this is not historical. Jesus' intention is to be really present in the species of bread and wine. And, and I have written about this extensively uh, in a book called God So Loved the World. If you go to that book, chapter three, and just go down to the section on the Eucharist, I have an entire section on why uh, this interpretation of Jesus and history is completely wrong. But I'm going to give you the brief synopsis of it now. Remember, Jesus is operating within the world milieu of, uh, you know, he, he's, he's a prophet, he's the Messiah, he's the Son of God. So when he is intending, when he does, remember, uh, when he's doing the rite of uh, the, the body, or which is the rite of the bread, and the rite of his blood, which is the rite of the red wine, after the supper, right? So he separates the two uh, items, right? When he does the rite of the bread, he is speaking as a uh, in a prophetic way and you say well what's a prophetic way of speaking it's called the prophetic future uh, a prophet and this is hard for us to understand because we we look at time in terms of relativity theory or we look at time as having a physical reality that underlies physical events but in point of fact uh, um, for Jesus a time was completely collapsible so you could take the time that intervened between a future event like his crucifixion and uh, the present moment in which he exists, and that would be, of course, at the Last Supper, he believes that that time can collapse completely, and so the event into the, uh, in the future can come literally through his prophetic pronouncement as uh, the Messiah and the Son of God as well. It's not just his prophetic pronouncement, but his messianic and, 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 and divine pronouncement uh, of, of the, you know, this is my body um, given for you, right? That the minute he makes that the present tense, right? This is my body given for you, right? The minute that is done, mm -hmm. he literally collapses the future moment, right? Uh, namely, his crucifixion into the species of the bread that he is handing to his disciples, making that species his future crucified body now. That's what he believes he is doing. That is the context out of which he is operating. Jesus doesn't have a notion of time. Uh, like our notion of time. I mean, even if he knew that in his divinity, he certainly wasn't doing that in his humanity and divinity at the Last Supper. He is speaking, as it were, in this prophetic way, collapsing time into the sacred moment of the future, making his body really present. And the same thing with the uh, a wine, the ceremony of the wine. After the supper, which becomes his blood, he is collapsing the, the time between uh, his, the the uh, um, a future event of his blood being poured out on the cross and that cup in the present moment uh, at the supper, he's collapsing it so that the mm -hmm. actual his actual future blood becomes part of the wine. Mm -hmm. Now that's one half of the story, uh, Angel. The other half of the story uh, is that um, uh, Jesus also 
as a, a Semite, right? He's, he's a Jewish rabbi. He believes totally that by reliving something, so that if you relive a sacred event, and here comes the same terms again, you can collapse time once again. So, for example, when a priest says Mass this very day, right, when he says Mass, that he is collapsing time. This is now a prophetic, the, <clears throat> the priest is prophet. When the priest says the Mass and the very relives the words of consecration at the altar, he collapses the time between the past event, namely Jesus' crucifixion and Jesus' Last Supper, which are now conjoined by Jesus' prophetic words, right? Jesus intends that the priest use the same prophetic words through the power that he has given to his apostles and their successors to use the same prophetic words to collapse the time from uh, the um, uh, um, present mm -hmm. back into uh, the past event of the crucifixion and into the Last Supper. So literally, Jesus' crucified body, just like, you know, that, um, uh, you know, is becoming present in that species of bread. His blood pouring from the cross is becoming present in the words of consecration, in the prophetic pronouncement of the words um, by uh, the priest. Now, this is what he means by, see, the Greek word is anamnesis, right, which means remembrance. Mm -hmm. The Jewish people had no such notion as purely mental remembrance. I mean, th that's completely a Greek notion. Mm -hmm. It's it's taken oh, okay. from the Greek translation, anamnesis, of Jesus' words. But for all intents and purposes, what Jesus intends is that, like, for example, at the Passover, when the Father at the Passover is reciting the words of Passover and answering the questions of the youngest son, at the Passover table, they are collapsing uh, the, the time between their present event and the past event that gave rise, right, when the Israelites escaped from Egypt. The same thing happens with the priest who's doing it. This is what Jesus intends. But now it is animated, not just with the prophetic words, but Jesus' own risen presence. So in other words, Jesus' risen presence then is also conjoined to the crucified presence which the priest is effecting by collapsing the time between his words and the past moments of Jesus' crucifixion and Last Supper. It all comes into the bread and into uh, the wine of consecration, the literal body and blood of Christ. Now I've explained this with extensive footnotes and details. Uh, from good scholarly articles going back to the time of Gerhard von Rad, right, in his uh, book, you know, the Old Testament Theology, Volume 2, but going all the way through the very fine works of uh, Joachim Jeremias, the Eucharistic Words of Jesus, O. Meyer, and of uh, Johannes Betz, and uh, John P. Meyer, the uh, uh, Catholic um, mm -hmm. uh, exegete who wrote uh, 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 A Marginal Jew, mm -hmm. and that would be in Volume 2 of A Marginal Jew. So all these footnotes are there. I'm not dreaming this up. I mean, this is real history. This is real hermeneutics. And anybody who tells you that the Greek overlay of merely mental memory is the only thing that is affected is just dead wrong. They're not looking at history. They're not looking at contemporary exegesis we, uh, and hermeneutics. We have more than enough evidence to substantiate this position uh, on the real presence of of Christ, and this would have been in Jesus' mind. Jesus wasn't a Greek. Mm -hmm. Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. He came out of an apocalyptic tradition. He believed himself not only to be the Messiah, but the exclusive Son of the Father, the divine preexistent mm -hmm. one, who he called the Son of Man. And the Son of Man refers back to Daniel uh, uh, 7, mm -hmm. uh, 15 through 31. 
or the Son of Man is coming on his throne from heaven, pre-existence, existence, coming into the world with all of God's angels surrounding him to be the definitive judge of the world. This is what Jesus calls himself, but privately to his disciples. He says, no one knows uh, the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wishes to reveal him. Right. In other words, the, father, the Son knows the Father as the Father knows the Son. And knowing is not a me merely mental activity. It is a mental, but also an, a definitely a loving, personal, conjoining unity of being with the Father. This is the Semitic mentality. So we have to break out of our Greek categories, move back into the categories of Jesus, in order to understand uh, his intention. And when you do, the real presence is totally mm -hmm. obvious. Right. Don't be buffaloed by second-rate scholarship, <laughs> second-rate history, mm -hmm. and second-rate hermeneutics that doesn't recognize Jesus' Jewish, Semitic, apocalyptic, and prophetic background. Right. If you do that, you got the wrong Jesus. You got the Jesus of Rudolf Bull. Mm -hmm. And Joachim Jeremias took care of that opinion quite effectively, you know, end of story. So in any right. case, uh, that's a quick answer to your well, question. Let me ask you a question there, on Angela, that too. But it was a really good one. Right, exactly. Yep. That's one, obviously, it's very popular today, obviously, in the Protestant yeah. world, even some places in uh, Sure. In the more Catholic world where people tend to wonder about uh, mm -hmm. the whole necessity. I mean, ultimately, it breaks down to the need for the priesthood in some ways. Uh, yeah. You know, and that's obviously yeah. why you don't see it in, in, in these other denominations. One of the things, too, uh, just a couple of minor things mm -hmm. in my limited knowledge of these things. Certainly, there's the, the Eucharistic mm -hmm. discourse with the whole idea of, you know, this is a hard teaching. Well, if it's mm -hmm. just a sign, why would it be so hard? And we also know from some of, I think, yeah. uh, one of the historians... Uh, I don't know, uh, Roman historian, um, Tacitus or one of them, or whether it's Josephus, yeah. one of them who was Jewish, but one of those where mm -hmm. they reference about the whole idea of the early church being accused of cannibalism, right? Exactly. Uh, that would be Josephus, right. and that would be uh, in, on, in his uh, history of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. um, and absolutely correct, um, uh, Doug. And yes, so uh, that certainly gives you a, a very good idea of what um, the early church thought. And by the way, I mean, there's just no question that the preponderance of evidence, not just in, in uh, John's gospel, who, you know, where Jesus is, uh, is saying, you know, um, you know, this is my real flesh, this is my real blood, and my real flesh is real food, mm -hmm. and my real blood is real drink. You know, I mean, uh, can you get any more, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, definitive on this matter? You can go right through the Gospel of John and see how the early church uh, interpreted this. You, you don't have to go through all the hermeneutics I just, uh, you know, was mm -hmm. talking about. Uh, it's very, very obvious uh, in John John's Gospel, and certainly, as you put it, in the accusations recorded by Josephus right. uh, in the history of the Jewish people, uh, among m other kinds of texts in the early church fathers too, uh, it's it's very clear, right. uh, you know, that uh, th this is uh, viewed as the real body and blood of Christ. Especially, you want to uh, attend to two letters from Ignatius of Antioch, a very early uh, church father uh, who wrote about this and wrote okay. about this. In, in very clear language. I right. uh, just put into your Google search engine, Ignatius of Antioch, Holy Eucharist, Real Presence. You'll get those two letters.